Welcome to the third video of endotracheal intubation video series. In the previous two videos, we talked about the indications, contraindications, and the setup of endotracheal intubation procedure. Now, let's get you familiar with some of the instruments that are essential in endotracheal intubation procedure. In today's video, we're going to talk about laryngoscopes and laryngoscopy. We're going to talk about the endotracheal tube itself, the stylets, and the endotracheal tube introducers. Please make sure you watch these videos in order as the information in each video build on the information mentioned in the video before. And before we start, please make sure you tap that subscribe button if you have not subscribed to our channel yet so you get to see our videos as soon as they are released. And if you find this video and this series useful, please don't forget to like and share this video and the whole series. Let's start. Let's start by talking about laryngoscopes and laryngoscopy. So laryngoscopes from its name is the instrument that we use to perform laryngoscopy. So what's laryngoscopy? Simply it's an endoscopy of the larynx. So it's really important at this point that we review the anatomy of the larynx. Take a look at this picture and see how the tongue is related to the epiglottis and see the recess or the space between the tongue and the epiglottis, the velliculum. Also see the epiglottis is like a lid or cover of the glottis. So when the epiglottis is elevated, it will expose the glottis and the vocal cords. That's the space. That's where you need to insert your ET tube. So you see how important to have a good view of this structure. And that's the job of the laryngoscopes is to allow you to visualize this so you can elevate the epiglottis and insert the ET tube through that. As you see, all the money is in finding where is the epiglottis and finding a way to elevate the epiglottis to expose the vocal cords and the glottis so you can insert the ET tube in. So from seeing this, you know that the job of laryngoscopes is to move the structures and mainly I'm talking about the tongue, the mandibles and epiglottis anteriorly and superiorly. This way we can expose what's underneath the epiglottis, which is again the glottis and the vocal cords, so we can insert the ET tube or endotracheal tube through. So from this, you will see that the anatomy or the shape of laryngoscopes should follow this anatomy to allow us do this movement by moving these structures out of the view because it's blocking. If you just look directly into the mouth, you're not going to see anything. So you have to do this movement superiorly and anteriorly so you can visualize what's underneath the epiglottis and insert the ET tube. Now, laryngoscopy can either be direct or indirect. Direct mean I use the laryngoscope and I take a direct look with my eyes. Okay? So the laryngoscopes, which has a blade and a light source, and then I take a look with my own eyes. Why indirect from its name, I use the blades with a light source, but I take a look at the airway structures indirectly. And the most common one by looking at a screen or mirror, but mainly nowadays we're looking at the screen. So the blade has a light source and a camera and allow me to see the structure by looking at the screen instead of looking directly into the airways. Let's start talking about direct laryngoscopies. Laryngoscopes that use indirect laryngoscopies are either curved, and remember laryngoscopes basically it's a blade with a, a source of light. So either curved or straight. The most commonly used curved one is the famous Macintosh blade or Mac blade, named after its designer, Sir Robert Macintosh. I think he's from New Zealand and he was the first anesthesiologist from outside the United States. And the most commonly straight blade used in cl clinical practice is the Miller blade. These blades, the Mac and Miller, 
and they are the most widely used. Of course, there is less common types, which I'm not gonna mention here, but the most commonly used one, they are everywhere, is the Mac, the curved, the Miller, the straight. They come, as you know, in different sizes. And the size of the blade mainly based on its length. The size range from zero to four, zero for neonates, one for infants, two for children, three for medium adults, and four for large adults. Look, look at this chart. It tells you each number mean a specific length, which of course different from Mac and Miller blade. So you need to familiarize yourself because you need to pick what size of a blade you need to use in endotracheal intubation. As we're focusing here on adults, so mainly we're using either three or four. In general, I use three in females and four in males, and sometimes it change based on my estimation looking at the size. Now, in direct laryngoscopies, we're gonna talk about the most commonly used one, which is video laryngoscopy. There's a screen provided that we can see the airway structure through, and these are categorized based on the shape of the blade, either the Macintosh style blade or the acute angle blade from its name. Also, they can be categorized whether they are channeled or non-channeled. Channels mean it accommodates the ET tube with it. So while we are doing the laryngoscopy, the ET tube is there, so it guides the ET tube insertion directly, as you see in the picture. While non-channeled, so you do the laryngoscopies and you insert the ET tube independently. Also, the blades used in video laryngoscopies comes in different sizes, from zero to four. And in adults, again, there is size three, size four, and I apply the same formula, it's easy females three, males four, and again, that's not fixed completely. Sometimes you have a large female or a small male, so you can adjust, but it's easy, three and four. And again, these are based on the length. Now, by far, the most commonly used and the widely available here in the United States is the glidoscope, which is a non-channeled video laryngoscopy. And as I said, it comes with either a Macintosh style blade or an acute angle blade. And the size again in adults three or four, as we just explained. Whether to use direct laryngoscopy or indirect or video laryngoscopy, it depends what you have at your facility. If you do have glidoscope, I always use that first. It's by far much easier compared to indirect laryngoscopy technique wise. And I think there was multiple stu studies and showing that the pass rate, first time intubation is higher in glidoscope or video laryngoscopies compared to indirect laryngoscopies. And for anticipated difficult intubation, you have access to a glidoscope or video laryngoscopy, always use it. You don't have to try indirect laryngoscopy. So check what you have at your facility. Now regarding the technique, again, it's not fair to just describe to you how to do it. As I said before, this is a technique you have to have a hand-on experience, a hand-on learning by an experienced provider. It, it's not practical till you go from this angle and then move it this way and then elevate it this way. You're not gonna get it unless you do it yourself. Now let's move and talk about the endotracheal tube itself, the tube that we need to insert it through the vocal cords. Now endotracheal tubes can be either oral, which is the most common one, or nasal, nasotracheal tubes, can be cuffed, that has a cuff or balloon to prevent air leak and prevent aspiration, or uncuffed, that doesn't have any balloon, and this mainly in pediatric population, and can be single lumen or double lumen. Double lumen mainly in thoracic surgeries when one of the lungs need to be deflated. The most commonly used one is the single lumen cuffed oral endotracheal tube. Now let's look at the parts of the endotracheal tube. The endotracheal tube is made of course of the tube, the cuff, the bevel, and Murphy's eye. So the tube, it has a length and a diameter. And most of the tubes mainly made from PVC. 
PVC is a radiolucent material. That's why we put a radio opaque line throughout the tube. So when we shoot an X-ray, we could see it and confirm its position, right? As you see this thin line here, it's much thinner than the tube. That's what we see on the chest X-ray and we'll come to that later on. Also very important that the ET tube has length and diameter. The size of the ET tube when we decide to intubate is usually a reflection of the inner diameter of the ET tube. So when we say size six, that means the inner diameter is six millimeter, seven, seven, uh, the inner diameter is seven millimeter, uh, eight, the inner diameter is eight millimeter. In adults, we mainly use in females seven to 7.5 and in males eight to 8.5. And if you are in doubt, at any point, 7.5 usually works most of the time. So that's another information you need to provide when you decide to intubate a patient to your respiratory therapist. I need an ET tube size 7.5, for example. That means the inner diameter is 7.5 millimeter. It's very important to understand that because the smaller the diameter, the greater the resistance. That can create problems in the mechanics of airway movement. Like when the patient is awake doing spontaneous breathing trial, it will be much harder for the patient to breathe through a small tube compared to a larger diameter tube. Also, if you're anticipating you need a bronchoscopy, you need at least to pick at an ET tube that's 7.5 millimeter or bigger to allow that procedure. Also, there is these black marks on the ET tube every two centimeters to give you an idea about the length. I use the central, we use the central incisors and there in females, we pick to be around 21 centimeters. You look at the tube, it will be, give, make sure the 21 or 22 centimeters is right there at the central incisor, while in female, 23 to 24 centimeters. So it's very important to have the appropriate length, otherwise you'll end up with the right main stem intubation. And again, we'll talk about all of this in the future videos. Now let's move and talk about the cuff or the balloon. We inflate this balloon through the pilot balloon. You see, this is the pilot balloon. We push the air through and this air will inflate the cuff or the balloon as well. So the pilot balloon can be a good reflection of the status of the cuff itself. So if the pilot balloon is soft and it's not that firm, most likely the cuff itself is damaged or there's a problem with it. So we push air with a syringe, we push the air in, and then once the cuff is inflated, it acts like a seal to prevent any air leak, to prevent any loss of pressure, and to prevent any aspiration whether blood, saliva, food, it will seal all of that. Only the air will go through the tube, only through the tube into the trachea, nothing else will pass. Now the bevel you can see in this picture is the angle at the distal tip of the ET tube. And basically this created to allow us the movement of the ET tube and visualization of the vocal cord during the insertion procedure during intubation procedure. And finally, the Murphy's eyes, it's opening at the distal tip, at the lateral wall of the distal part of the ET tube. And this is like a safety mechanism, just in case the tube itself is blocked, the air has another way to get through. If there is a blockage, the air still have a way to get in and out through that one. Now let's move and talk about the stylet. It's very important that you have a stylet. The stylet is a device that we insert into the ET tube itself that will stiffen the ET tube itself and allow us also to shape the ET tube the way we want. Make it a C shape, hockey stick shape, whatever you like. That's the job of the stylet. Also to stiffen it, when we push it, it will not kink or do any weird things and we can push it through the trachea. It's very important not to forget to make sure there's a stylet already inserted into the ET tube and make sure it's, it's inserted properly. The tip of it is not going from the other side, from the tip of the, it has to be still within the endotracheal. Now let's move and talk about the last instrument in this video, which is the ET tube or endotracheal tube introducers. There's different type of introducer, but the most commonly used one is what we call the bougie catheter. It looks similar to a stylet. It's like 50 to 60 millimeter stylet. 
with the distal tip bent at 30 degree angle. It's simply very similar to the guide wire when you're inserting a central line if you have done central line before. It's very helpful in mainly two things. First, exchanging an ET tube or endotracheal tube. You have an endotracheal tube already, but let's say the cuff is malfunctioning, is not inflating. So what you do, you bring this stylus or this bougie catheter or this introducer, you insert it into this already placed ET tube. And then you take the ET tube itself and leave the catheter or introducer itself. And then you insert the new ET tube over this bougie catheter the in or introducer. And then you pull the catheter and then you push the endotracheal tube. So you don't need laryngoscopies or anything. The other job of it, which is difficult intubation. So when there is really difficult intubation for a reason or, or another, and using laryngoscopy, instead of inserting the view may be difficult. Ins instead of inserting the ET tube directly, you insert this bougie catheter or introducer first through the vocal cords, and then after that, you bring the endotracheal intubation and insert it over this bougie catheter, as we just explained, and then pull the bougie catheter out. Next video, we'll talk about the sedatives needed in endotracheal intubation, the paralytics as well, or the RSI, rapid sequence induction, or intubation remember to watch this video series in order and again remember if you have not subscribed to our channel to tap that subscribe button remember to like and share this video i'll see you next video